All right, so welcome back to uh, JS Podcast. Today we have Juan Velasquez with us. He is from uh, Cruise Planners, and uh, that's, uh, I believe, a company that you own, right? And that's right. That's right. Cruise Planners uh, is a franchise operation okay. that I invested in a few years ago um, as part of my portfolio of investments and that I've been doing for several years now, and I thought... Why not add a travel agency? And on top of that, why not add it during COVID? Mm. <laughs> Interesting. Right? Mm. Uh, so, so okay, so it's a franchise that you've invested into, and um, but you're actively running it or you're an active pr participant in that. Absolutely. One of the things that I pride myself is knowing the product um, and investing myself in um, what I'm bringing to the client. We don't want to just um, produce a product that um, will hopefully sell itself. We want to produce a product that we are um, very knowledgeable about and we're connoisseurs of. So especially if someone comes to us with a specific request, we want to make sure that we are extremely well versed in what comes with that request. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, and we'll get into this uh, more about your company and, and what you do. But today, who are you? Like, <laughs> what is your life like today? Are you married? You have kids? Um, do you do other things outside the company? Sure. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I've been here in the Carolinas for um, going on a decade now. And we came down on an opportunity that my spouse had. Um, brought her down here with the financial market. And we have a young son who's in high school, ready to go to college. And we knew that it would be a great opportunity for him to um, grow and get a grassroots education here in the South, especially in the Fort Mill, Waxhaw, greater area here. Um, just great, great opportunities for uh, young people, right? Mm -hmm. So we uh, looked at all the potentials and we decided, yeah, this is the best place to move. Um, at the time, I was working in sports and entertainment for 25 years. Um, so moving wasn't something easy. Okay. Uh, it took a lot of logistics, which is what I also was involved in, in operations and logistics and event management for various organizations um, throughout those 25 years. But yeah, you know, I, I, I enjoy, um, you know, spending a great time with our family. You know, we, we have um, a variety of things that we um, love to do throughout our community, especially. Uh, my son's a photographer. Um, my wife, um, she is vested into philanthropy, mm -hmm. which I am as well. You know, we move, um, we try to move uh, barriers that once were created by society for especially homelessness and other ventures that um, most people only donate to during the holidays, right? Mm -hmm. We um, are a full-time philanthropic family, mm -hmm. I guess you would say, um, in addition to what we do <laughs> as well as, uh, as business owners. But, um, you know, we, we, we also are big on our mission to continue with the Carolina Outpost, which is a um, part of Mission Uprising, as you know, Jerry. Um, Mission Uprising was founded in the Indiana outposts um, by a group of gentlemen who believed in uh, John Eldridge's message and, um, and continued that um, forward into the Carolinas. And I've been a part of that for many years and several outposts, and I'm really happy about um, expanding on that now. Okay. So you mentioned you moved down here. Where did you move from? Well, I moved from Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> the okay. Bricks. Yeah, the Bricks um, is what we nicknamed the town. Of course, Queen City is Charlotte, but we were Brick City in Newark. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we actually lived in the suburbs in New Jersey for quite some time. Uh, my wife is a Jersey girl herself, too, but she was born in a Caribbean island called Puerto Rico. So. Okay. I'm very fortunate for that, and um, my roots trace back to Puerto Rico and Spain, 
So I'm really fortunate to have a good heritage background and um, that diverseness that I brought down with me. Nice. So uh, just to learn a little bit more about you, you mentioned, were you born in Puerto Rico? Well, my wife was. I wasn't. I was uh, born in Newark, so I guess you would call me a New Yorican. That's <laughs> the, the that's the thing they uh, usually call us up north when we're Puerto Rican and we're born in the tri-state New York area. Um, I I enjoy the the roots and my heritage. Um, you know, I I often celebrate it um, throughout the year, especially this time of year during the holidays. It's a lot of fun. So much fun to um, um, cook the different traditional meals and, um, you know, reminisce with family, um, you know, over the fireplace, uh, um, telling stories and um, waiting on what we uh, wait on is Three Kings Day. So that's what we wait on. Okay. So you grew up um, basically in New York. Uh, and when you were in in grade school middle school high school what was your life like at that point and who were you were you um this outgoing kid or were you quiet who were you like <laughs> <laughs> that's great because i went to catholic school right um for the most part of my um adolescence uh, especially up to eighth grade mm -hmm. Um, I was a really good kid, actually, until I met middle school. And I was just, I got in trouble all the time. I was the class clown. Um, I just couldn't get in, get get enough of being in trouble. I just got, uh, you know, an adrenaline rush from it. Um, but the risk behind it was just, uh, um, to me, uh, profound because it, it, gain the attention from my peers mm -hmm. and uh i love that attention i i got the wrong affirmation <laughs> <laughs> but um surely i i actually went to high school in california hmm. and so midway in my academic adolescence um i was sent off to california to live with my sister in burbank okay and uh, in L.A. County, I went to a school called John Burroughs High School. Very famous high school, by the way. It's, it's fabulous, beautiful. It's uh, tucked in in the San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, I learned a valuable lesson. I was the only Puerto Rican in my entire high school. Wow. <laughs> wow. So a lot, a lot of uh, young adults, they... they I don't know about today, but definitely in the past uh, years, everybody wants wanted to go to L.A., right? L.A. was the place to go and yeah. live and become a movie star or whatever star. And you said you were sent there, so you were kind of like um, unintentionally. You, you, you came around to that area. What was that like? What was your life like over there? Man, that's good. That's good because I, I've made so many great friendships from living out in California. I mean, I have great friendships that continue from New Jersey, obviously, but uh, the friendships that I developed in California were lifelong. Um, and I'll tell you why. You know, we, we were part of a band of mitzvahs and, and individuals that didn't fit in. And yeah, I, I was I fell in love with film and cinematography, as a matter of fact, so much so that my sister said, well, you know, in order for you to graduate, you might want to um, take some um, courses um, that the county is offering. And they enrolled me in this program called the Warner Brothers Cinema Academy. Mm -hmm. And it is part of the Los Angeles Regional Occupational Program for individuals like myself that were failing, had no hope. And um, they said, well, we, we can see a turnaround. So I joined this class. I never held a camera before. I don't know what, a, what any, any of that, you know, the mm -hmm. most I ever held were those paper cameras, <laughs> the long boxy ones. Uh -huh. or, oh, yeah, yeah, the, one, you know, the instant ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one time, one time, yes. So yeah. I, I, I never had that opportunity, but it was great learning about cinematography, learning about the art of film, um, being creative in my writing and being told that no matter what I put pen to paper, it was, you know, my perspective and I should flow with it. 
And um, eventually it became not just a hobby, but kind of a, a secret career, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but I, uh, I've i learned to adapt and um, assimilate to certain um, things that have occurred in my life. And uh, I've used some of my talents like those to help me propel me to the next level in careers and whatnot. But I'll tell you, you know, there wasn't a person that I didn't know um, that uh, wouldn't say, well, you know what? Juan knows best. Ask him what movie, what this, what that. It, when it came to cinematography, I I, I was just, um, I became a connoisseur. I became someone of a... Uh, and I do that with most of the things that I uh, invest myself into, whether it's uh, monetary or physically. I, I try to learn it to the fullest and and then continue on in that venture. But, yeah, that was a lot of fun growing up with um, guys like Michael Gerhardt, um, who owned La La Land Records, mm-hmm. uh, Todd Jensen, who's an incredible writer and author, um, published, by the way, um, you know, Angela Hine and uh, um, Cal Briggs, all these people who actually work behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's really good. And, and another one, Adam Scott. Adam Scott, who very famously did Parks and Recreation. Okay. So you were like in school with them? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Like some of us were in the same school. Some of us were just filling a void in life. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't necessarily a course that was given by a high school. It was Los Angeles's way of bringing life to a vocation uh, that most people wanted to have and uh, could have for free. And it was a lottery system. I have no idea till this day. Um, how that occurred, but I do know that at the time he wasn't working for him, but my sister's uh, husband, you know, he has always been involved in the en- entertainment business. And, you know, once upon a time, he has been involved with Steve Harvey. So mm-hmm. I could imagine they pulled some strings. <laughs> yeah. So I connect- it seems like in life, connections definitely. Um, enable opportunities or provide opportunities but you mentioned you were sent there and you mentioned that your your schooling wasn't as great something to that effect it sounded like your your earlier uh, years were not all um, walk in the park can you elaborate a little bit more on that I was involved in uh, more than just being a class clown Mm -hmm. in school I was involved in Um, the world that I was um, enveloped into and uh, thrusted, um, you know, and my family was very big. My parents did the best they could, but the world around us swallowed us whole, all of us. Um, You know, all of our, all of my siblings were um, equally affected in one way or another, but I tended to lean towards that mischievous and maybe a little bit of a element without a criminal intent but there was that element that was um, outlandish and uh, maybe an outlaw as well Um, I hung out with the wrong crowds and I think hung out is a a very you know loose word right Mm -hmm. Uh, because it was more than just hanging out this was a gang of individuals that i um, befriended and you know things of that nature um you know and the the prevalent drugs that were available in the communities and the um uh, the crimes that were occurring uh that would influence some of the natures that i would be involved in so it uh it was a shell shock to my parents to see their baby boy you know, um, be swallowed up by this environment. Uh, they thought they had, you know, paved the right path for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, unfortunately for them, the world had other, you know, uh, opportunities that they were trying to venture me into that were not lucrative, I guess, in the same sense that most other people would, um, want to say, lucrative you know um they were lucrative in a in an ill ill intent manner so um you know i knew that i was involved in some mischief but 
not to the extent of when I reflected later in life and saw myself in a lens and I said, wow, I cannot believe that I've surpassed some of the things that I have done. What was, what was it like uh, being, I'm assuming you were approached or, or you approached them like what was that like is, was it is it subtle is it like hey you know let's let's try this out here or do this thing here or like what was that initiation like for you and mm -hmm. and did you at first resist it were you like oh, i think you guys are in the wrong crowd i don't know if i want to be part of it or were you like just like yeah let's let's do this you know that's a good question because interestingly i had friends outside of that realm. I had very good friends that were childhood friends that I grew up with. And they had their own little inner circle of friends. And we all teed up and became friends and uh, did things amongst ourselves. But um, and we never related um, our our other lives with the lives that we built. The friends that I made outside of that circle were friends influenced by older siblings that were well, well involved in uh, a life um, in in the um, in the best way to put it in a life that um, most people would anticipate a young man living in an urban area without any hopes and dreams would um, become captivated with because they thought there was no other answer. So um, at some point, I became that individual as well because I saw that they always had nice sneakers on or a nice big puffy coat at the time in the 80s and 90s. And, or, you know, they always had jewelry or, or money, right? So that fascinated me, you know, the fact that they were always driving around in nice cars. And I wanted to be that way. I wanted that life. But... Again, you know, looking back, it was the wrong path, you know, and um, it wasn't just one instance. It was a series of of events that occurred that wanted me to lead to that path, you know, just visualizing and seeing individuals doing certain things that were outside of the norm for me that intrigued me. I'm just thinking in terms of like um, children today or young adults today what are those signs both for them themselves it's like okay when you see this or that kind of step back step away from that group of people and then for their parents when they see their children getting slowly involved in certain things you know what are those tell tell signs right. so that parents can start talking to their kids about it well, i mean they they can start talking about it all the time right but like especially when they notice something's not quite right and how do they go about having that conversation with their with their children that's a great question and i can tell you from my perspective what i've done and some of the telltale signs and some of the things that you want to look for um are you know evasiveness from being around your family you know always wanting to be around a, a typical group of individuals that they would not normally um, bring to their home, mm -hmm. you know. Normally, these individuals that um, they befriend are individuals that they know are bad because they're not going to introduce to mom and dad, um, and they're not going to introduce to their normal friends. Um, and a lot of that starts with bad influences, you know. Uh, some of the ways to find... Um, your children's um, uh, false affirmations is by enabling affirmations for them at home consistently. I found by doing that with my son, it deters him from um, leaning towards false affirmations from groups of individuals that may promise him a brighter future or a brighter life um, through uh, a life of criminality and, and criminal intent. So, you know, it, it really falls upon the parental guidance to say, you know what, I'm going to try my best to affirm what I believe and instill that in that individual 
um, because there's not one thing that you can actually really do. You know, eventually life will just take its course and um, the child will either take that risk or not. Mm -hmm. But I think the greater opportunity that you put upon the child, that they're being affirmed and they and that they are loved and that they are uh, accepted for whom they are and that they are um, creative processors and that they are um, extraordinary in the world and that they are needed and wanted because that's the key, you know, not being felt that you are wanted, mm -hmm. you know, and for so long, I know I struggled with that as a child. I felt the need of being wanted. And the minute you start seeing a child uh, pull away from you and, and um, escaping into their own world, that's when you need to um, go and, and, and fight for them and, and go down that rabbit hole and chase after them. Um, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> You may uncover some stuff about yourself that you may not like, but more importantly, you're going to be able to chase after your child before they make that crucial mistake of being part of a group of individuals that may not be fashionable for them in the future and, you know, could could be a detriment. Yeah. So so you were you were kind of sent by your parents or by somebody yeah yeah because so of all of that my my parents you know and, <laughs> and you know i i'll i'll delete some of the details but the bottom line is, is my parents saw that i kept on being uh removed from schools kept kicked out of schools back to back and it happened mm -hmm. so quickly and um they they just got so scared um they didn't want me to become um my older sibling for mm -hmm. sure um, so they thought this was a great idea. <laughs> Send them out to L.A., the gang capital of the world. <laughs> you know, and, and saying, better yet, send a young Latino male to L.A., the gang capital of the world, right? But, you know, New York was just hustling, bustling with, with gangs, and so was Newark. But yeah. um, L.A. was a different type of um, category of gangs and violence and Thankfully, I was in an area where it was, um, you know, blue skies, picket fences, you know. Um, I tell everyone I was in the studio capital of the world um, in Burbank. You know, think think about it. I mean, you have Warner Brothers, CBS, NBC, uh, some of the biggest names, Viacom. So, yeah, I, I, I was surrounded by affirmation without it being told to me it was just instant inspirational motivation and and then the sense of shock and awe of leaving your bubble mm -hmm. right because sometimes that's how you get to the kids you have to get them out of that bubble and introduce them to a different world and maybe that'll shock them into a different um you know a different path yeah so when you um when you came down there, you, you didn't get involved in the old lifestyle or did you? So, you know, at first I was highly tempted there. Although I was the only Puerto Rican, there was 12 other um, South American uh, mixed races in the school. Mm -hmm. So I, I, instantly it was just like, hey, man, you're one of us. Come hang out with us. You know, you don't want to hang out with the Valley kids and, you know, their their drop down uh, cor Corvettes and their, you know, Mustangs. And, you know, it was just such a different, different world. I felt like I was living a movie, some type of <laughs> other other life that I might have lived, maybe. Or, you know, watching myself from the multiverse and say, look at this guy. What's going on? But um uh, it, it was it was really um, at first misleading, mm -hmm. you know, because I said, all right, well, I feel at home with these guys. I want to stay with these guys. But they were really bad guys, hmm. really, really bad guys. And uh, had I not met uh, Michael Gerhardt, who I mentioned earlier, I probably would have been stuck with those bad guys and maybe not sitting here with you. My mm -hmm. story might have been different. So yeah, it was it was uh, shock and awe again. I, I'll use that word a lot, man. Yeah, and Michael was 
your age at the time? Yeah, yeah. Me and Michael were in the same um, grade, and but Michael was a little bit different. <laughs> I, uh, when he watches this, he's going to laugh. Um, Michael was fascinated by the movie industry. I mean, he had been involved probably his entire adolescence um, watching um um, ingesting movies and 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 just creating um, ideologies based on the characters that he um, idolized. Uh, you know, once upon a time, uh, I need a hero type of characters. You know, the Sylvester Stallones and the Tom Cruises blowing things up and the Arnold Schwarzeneggers and all that. But he was just, um, um, I think the best way to, um, describe him as there's a film called A Few Good Men <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, I believe it's Lieutenant Kathy uh, who's the lawyer uh, played by Tom Cruise and you can correct me later on um, or when our viewers watch they can correct me but um, you know uh, he was that character his whole life you know at least throughout high school and uh, he lived it. He lived it and, and he owned up to it. And I just kind of loved um, having this unique individual outside of my typical <laughs> realm of friends. And I just welcomed him in to my life. He welcomed me in into his life. And he wanted to learn so much about me. And he was intrigued about how this kid from Newark, New Jersey could turn around his life. Um, and he wanted to, he wanted to be part of that. He wanted to hear more. And we got, we, we, we really garnered a great friendship from it at the time. Did he become uh, an actor or writer or like, what, what does he do today? So today Michael owns La La Land Records. Um, La La Land Records is a company that redistributes uh, scores and soundtracks. Um, mm -hmm. He purchases from um, the studios and whatnot. And uh, he's very successful from what I know. I Unfortunately, Michael and I um, talk more on social media than we do um, just like everyone else, right? Yeah. That's become the norm now. Yeah. Uh, but um, he, he and I, our last reunion was about 10 years ago. And uh, we all met, as a matter of fact, he uh, and I and, and Todd Jensen uh, all met together in Burbank um, and uh, had a wonderful time. But um, maybe it's time for, for a new uh, uh, reunion, for sure. Yeah. So, um, so that was kind of high school. And who, who else was in your environment or in your circle that was uh, consciously or subconsciously giving you advice on what you should do, what path you should take in life at that time, like let's say 11th, 12th grade of high school? Yeah, you know, my brother-in-law, Rich Rosa, he was really an influence beyond um, many people's expectations. He took on a role to become, you know, a stepdad and, and a father figure for me. And I really respect that. Until this day, um, as a matter of fact, I had an opportunity to tell him recently in October of this year that, you know, that I respect and admire everything that he had um, told me because it's resonating later in life, right? It takes a little bit, you know, but, um, he really was influential in getting me motivated and telling me the right path and, um, really, um, uh, affirming a, a sense of a direction for, um, greatness and, and a process that's led me to where I'm at now, you know, just a self-motivating uh, process and a different mindset of um, perceiving um, a positive outlook and a motivational out, uh, output for yourself, um, which is rewarding financially and physically um, and emotionally. So I think uh, he's been one of the greatest influences that I've had for sure. So right after high school, where did you go? Did you go to college? Did you jump into a job? What did you do? So w right after high school, um, I did the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> I, um, I left back to New Jersey, okay. you know? Um, I had been accepted to several amazing schools, all right? I got accepted to NYU. 
all right? Many people said, what happened? I got accepted to Rutgers, mm -hmm. um, and I deferred that first year, eventually going to Rutgers, um, and I got accepted to several other small LA-based schools. Um, in high school, I was able to take uh, courses that coincided with um, some of the county college courses, so mm -hmm. was able to ascertain some some leverage there. But you know, I, I left back to New Jersey, and I found myself with my old friends, mm -hmm. right? You know, and, and what happens to someone when, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, you're, you're on this great diet and, and you're doing well and uh, you've given up all these maybe uh, carbonated drinks. And then uh, you go somewhere, uh, maybe to a beach party or something and say, there's soda flowing everywhere. And what do you do? You have a soda. Next thing you know, you realize, oh, my gosh, the taste of that soda was so good i missed it so long right mm -hmm. well that's how i felt about my friends mm -hmm. and um i was i was misled in my mind thinking that that was what i felt and i got into so much trouble um that summer was the summer of uh what i call in and out not burger but in and out of um different uh prisons you know you go in and out you know you get Take it in and get taken out. Take it in, take it out. And it was just horrible because here I came from having a major high in my life and people saying, wow, he really is moving forward towards a greater path. And even all those individuals that I left behind, they were like, wow, Juan's really going to do something. And yet I am mucking it up. So my father told me what any other father would say you're leaving this house one way or another you're going into the military and okay. thus i did navy boy i was short-lived wow. we'll leave it at that short-lived how short very short very short um let's just say i was doing rifle aerobics um and uh it was uh not the best of my days rifle aerobics really uh humbled me hmm. um you know you you really want to uh, understand that individuals that and I, I i love individuals that join the military because um i think joining the military should be a passion just like anything else you shouldn't just join the military to escape um a situation or a scenario um, I think that's the wrong message. And unfortunately, you know, my, my parents' generation had the wrong information. It wasn't that they were giving me the wrong advice. They just, uh, they themselves had the wrong information. Usually the thought is like, okay, if, if I send my kid to the military, they're going to straighten him out. They're going to give him discipline and, right. and all these kind of things. And I think for my dad, since he had experienced that himself mm -hmm. uh, as an adolescent, uh, growing up in Puerto Rico, you know, his father told him it's either the coffee farms or Vietnam, and he chose Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, but he himself ended up doing rifle aerobics in Tacoma, Washington, right? So, I think we share that same kinship that we, um, he was given that wrong, um, you know, path towards what should have been a brighter future, but it wasn't. It wasn't our choice. You know, my choice was to be, um, in better terms, a bandido, right? My choice was to be reckless. Um, and sometimes what you have to do is find how those things may sound negative, but put them in a positive connotation. All right. So you like to be a bandido, right? Well, then let's find something that brings that element, but for some good. Right. Let's find things in the world that that would really enhance uh, an effort to create new life, new prosperity, new investments, new things, because we all need a bandido in every risk that we take in investments. We always need that that just dark horse that comes in there and slays the deal and says, all right, we're in it. Right. So my my choices were led by misinformation from that my parents had gathered mm -hmm. i guess that's the best way to put it so you got into the navy and got out of the navy uh what did you do next after that well 
I started working in sports and entertainment right after that. Um, you know, a lot of folk, unbeknownst to them, I walked into uh, the New Jersey Sports Exposition Authority, which was the Meadowlands in East Rutherford, New Jersey. And at the time, it was the Brendan Byrne Arena. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I walked in there with uh, an oversized suit. And it was a job fair. And uh, they tell me from a distance from the vomitory as I peek through um, to hear the sounds of the stages being built and things happening inside the arena. Um, one guy yells at me and he says, hey, you up there, come down here. So I did. Mm-hmm. Young, naive, cocky kid. I go down there. I'm like, what do you need? And he's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm here for the, you know, the the job fair. And he says, no, you're not. You know how to hold one of these. And he's waving a mallet. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know what a mallet was. I'm looking at him like, it looks like a hammer. Okay, sure. I know how to smash things with a hammer. But what they were doing was the ice was off. And they were putting the floorboards on so that the then New Jersey Nets could play. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were putting floorboards on top of ice. And this was before the NBA changed to massive um, 16 by 24 boards. This was smaller boards, smaller arena type. This was high school laying down boards. And it was tedious work one by one going down it was almost like putting in a whole new flooring you probably know all about it better than i do so i stood there in my suit worked disappeared from the crowd that was doing the job fair and i had a job and it was the first job that i ever had was putting floorboards on ice or removing floorboards on ice with a group of men that that's all they were contracted for at the Meadowlands, and I left that day with a fist full of dollars. It was fantastic. I was like, wow, look at this. This is amazing. This is money, like real stuff. Um, I remember having to walk on Route 4 and headed towards a town called Lynnhurst to try to find a bus in Kearney to get me to Penn Station North to take the subway home and then walk the rest. Um, I got home exhausted. Um, I I went back to live with my parents. And uh, no more than two hours later, my dad's getting up for work and the phone rings. And it's the Meadowlands. Mm -hmm. And they're asking for me. And they're saying, hey, we need you to come back and work for us again and this time you're going to keep working so my father knocks on the door he says hey get up Uh, there's a guy on the phone and he wants you to get to work Um, you have uh, 10 minutes to get ready I'm headed to work and uh, I'll drop you off on the way but the word drop off for my father was completely different than our meeting it drop off to him was one town over he's like all right i'm headed towards bayonne you got to figure your way over there from this point on here in in harrison new jersey mm-hmm. so, and i did i did and i made it to work and that was my first gig and and i was addicted from there on i had such a great great um number of jobs mm-hmm. so that one was more physical uh, preparing courts and arenas and that kind of thing, and then, uh, but you said you stayed in in uh, the sports field basically for like twenty five years or so. Yeah. W- what else did you do oh, during that time? A lot of great stuff, I'll tell you. You know, besides working, majority of the contracts that I did work, um, you know, uh, were setting up fields um, or you know working in theaters like the Richard Rogers Theater. I had an opportunity to work there. Um, For many people who don't know the Richard Roger Theater, they have had the um, biggest productions um, like Hamilton and other big productions. So creating stages for that um, uh, venue was great. But I had an opportunity to jump around from contract to contract really early on. I mean, I must have worked about 
10, 15 contracts and some of them overlapping each other the first 10 years of my career because I was just hustling for money. I was just looking for the next best thing. And, you know, to me, it was cash. Who yeah. needs a 1099 at the time? <laughs> Hopefully the IRS is not going to audit me for this, but that was many years ago. So I'm sure their systems are not well equipped to go back. But, um, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was addicting, you know, and I worked for um, DREs, which are Disney Regional Enterprises. And uh, those uh, led me to places like ESPN and um, led me to um, other um uh, different contracts that I built stages and it was more physical in the beginning it was all about the physicality but then I met some people who said hey Juan would you like to drive some of these guys and I said hmm sure what else is involved well you know some of these guys have some heavy luggage here I am 5'4 at the time I was a stocky round kid I said sure I'll do it <laughs> <laughs> so I did that um, for many years as well, um, contracted to work for um, Joe Gibbs Racing, okay. um, contracted to work for uh, clients like Darrell Revis, um, who once played for the Jets um, and then moved on to Tampa Bay. So a, a lot of individuals that I had um you know, Stephen A. Smith, once upon a time, I was his, his New York driver, um, per se, um, you know, for when he wasn't as popular as he is right now and amazing, too. Um, he's one of my um, idols that I look at and I'm like, man, that guy is just matter of fact is like, what? <laughs> that that guy is what? But he wasn't all that at the time. I didn't like the guy. I, I couldn't okay. stand the way he spoke to me or or treated me. But I think it was preparing me for everything that came after. Um, and uh, so I, I did I did some driving and then I did some operational work, which meant that I worked in the arenas, whether it was um, bottom of the line work cleaning. Mm -hmm. Most people don't like to do that. Well, I picked up on contracts that made a lot of money from our mark and big companies like um uh, that 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 basically came in like delaware north and prepared arenas whether it was facility services or the food and beverage services and i learned a ton about the operations behind that and then i joined organizations directly like the new york jets and learned about their operations with players and logistics and i learn more about that. I learned about um, different opportunities that arose with um, the Red Bulls, for instance, the New York Red Bull soccer organization. I was there for their um, two inaugural seasons in Harrison, New Jersey. I had a great crew. Um, we set up everything there, everything from the field to um, the equipment mm -hmm. <laughs> to setting up logistics for the evening for the families of the players when they were in the event. So we had a lot, a lot that I did in that entire span. So you were really involved in, in major sports, uh, major teams. Yeah. And some of the high profile players and announcers. And, um, so that's, that's pretty pretty cool <laughs> yeah i mean it wasn't all you know uh, it wasn't all pomp and service ads right i had jobs where i would go down for spring training baseball and work spring training because it was lucrative mm -hmm. you know you go down there and 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 uh, sell beer right you, you sell beer at the stands i'd go from lakeland to kissimmee to um um port st Lucie, uh to uh st petersburg and you'd go there, and, and what we would do, um, we were beer hawkers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the guy that goes, get your beer here, get your... That was, that was my line. <laughs> <laughs> that was my line. I was, get your beer here, $5 beer, $5 beer. And you, you know, you, you'd make great tips. You'd make great money. But the key was you had to buy a pallet uh -huh. of beer. And right? then resell it. And then charges. resell it. And, and I said, you know, I could do this. Yeah. I, I got the hustle for this. And I'd give people better deals. And the guy across the other side would say, I'll be back with some better deals than that guy. And I try to outsell them. Oh, man. It, it was it, that, hence why they called us beer hawkers. 
But um, it wasn't all lovely. I mean, I had jobs at Shea Stadium before it became City Field. I had jobs at the old Yankee Stadium, and these jobs were terrible jobs. They were just um, waiting if it rained. You had to roll out the tarp, um, you know, or, you know, waiting for the crowds to leave to clean up the whole entire stadium. Um, those were not fun jobs. <laughs> right, but, but throughout the whole thing, it sounds like you were a hard worker. You were You were willing to do anything like you're saying clean anything you had to do to earn earn the money basically what what drove you like what what was the motivation behind that i never wanted to see myself poor i just did not mm -hmm. you know when i when i met my wife uh she was surprised to always see me in a different car I wanted to be that guy, but I had friends and you know that that own automobile auto dealers, and and I'd say, hey, you know, can I borrow this car for the month? You know, and the, these would be the cars that they would typically use. Mm -hmm. But um, I always saw myself. Um, I always projected um, something greater, and and this goes back to what um, my brother-in-law Rich Rosa taught me. He said. Always project yourself in a greater way, in a greater fashion. If you come into an interview dressed in baggy pants and um, and and just in a big old hoodie, it better be that you're coming in for a job that requires you to work in a warehouse or somewhere in the back of the house where no one's seeing you. But even then, that's questionable because what respect are you giving the interviewer? Um, or the, the job who's offering to sit down with you for mm -hmm. 30 minutes, right? So I've always perceived that. I, w I always wanted to say, and it's not a false narrative. I think it's important for us to always show ourselves in a greater light so that we can be an influence to others unbeknownst to us. And, um, you know, I continue doing that. I got friends who will say, oh, well, you wear collar shirts now and you talk like that now. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm still the same cat that you do back in the day hanging out. I just learned more. I just, you know, adapted, you know, and some guys don't know how to adapt. They know the hustle, but they don't know how to adapt. And I know both. Yeah. Can't be the same. You, you cannot portray the same kind of mannerisms in all environments correct you have to adapt to different environments but i was surely motivated i was motivated by um not just being the thought of being poor but um i was always motivated by the thought of people following me because i've always had a leadership role and everything that i undertook i always said to myself all right you know what i'm going to come join this team whether it's a new contract I know there's going to be someone in charge, but I'm going to befriend that person outside of work. I'm going to learn who they are, what they know, and who they know mm -hmm. so that I could take their role next so that when they're ready to move on, they say, oh, we have the perfect candidate. And that's how I would hustle my way to the next top role. And I would it would happen almost instantly in some cases. You know, we would say they would say, hey, Juan, you know what? It so happens. <laughs> we're going to be um, moving so-and-so to a different position. Why don't you just come on? You seem to know what you're doing. Unbeknownst to them, I didn't. I just faked it till I made it, right? Just like everyone else. But it was just all about branding a leadership quality that I didn't know that I didn't, that, that I could, you know, project to people at the time, especially. I thought it was just a hustle. Yeah. So... You were in in that sports industry. Um, what was your family life like during that process? Like, oh, when did you did you get married? Did uh, like what was that like? So later in my career was when I met my wife, um, and um, you know I had been with another individual throughout the. Um, greater portion of my career in sports and entertainment, but it was when I, um, when I met my wife now was when I took on roles that allowed me to be home mm -hmm. more often. But before that, it was New Year's, Christmas, away from home. Um, but even after, even after the fact 
that I took on other jobs and other roles in the sports and entertainment industry, it did disrupt our um, family and our life for quite some time. Um, so we had to adjust. Um, my wife had to adjust schedules and, you know, we, we had a baby and it was just like, all right, well, what now? You work off hours and I work a nine to five. What do we do about child care? We don't have that family unit to help us out. So we were always hustling because we had to make more money than most. Daycare, rent, daycare, and rent. <laughs> So it was just always constantly on my mind. So I always worked. I always worked. I always needed to work. And so did she. So we, we didn't see an, uh, another alternative. And it got tiresome. Mm -hmm. It really did. It almost disrupted us many times. Um, but it just, we, we navigated around it for sure. And our relationship struggled for some times. And, but I think for the most part, we adjusted and we said, all right, well, this is what's working and maybe you need to change, um, you know, the gig that you're doing this, you know, maybe you should leave that contract and go do that one only, you know, at one point in time, I can remember doing five at the same time, hmm. five, <laughs> never knowing where I was going next. <laughs> You know, on a train to Manhattan or in a car to the Meadowlands or um, on a New Jersey transit train down to Philadelphia. I mean, it was just constant moving. Okay. And um, so during that time, you got married and you're, you're kind of working hard. You have these challenges. How did you overcome those challenges with your wife, like the relationship kind of? It's interesting. We, we, we struggled so much because we didn't have, um, we, we, we definitely weren't grounded in our religious beliefs. So we struggled with just like any other marriage would struggle, whether it was financing or, um, you know, emotional, um, you know, emotionally. So it was just a, a constant decision of, you know, do we give in and give up? Or do we continue um, fighting for each other and for what we believe that we started here? And I think at first it was a lot of it was trying to tell ourselves that um, we're not going to give up. I think the greatness of both my wife and I is that we don't give up and at least we don't give up that easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we, we'd we probably make great uh, uh, individuals uh, as, as test subjects for, you know, any one of those um, trial runs at uh, getting us, um, you know, to budge on our, um, on our responses, especially with our marriages. Uh, you know, we, we are very um, secure and, and, and grounded um, because of those struggles, but we really, um, took it situation by situation. We didn't have a godly, um, approach to anything. And I think a lot of us, um, that are Christians understand that the foundation to any relationship is, um, Jesus Christ first, and then everything else comes second. We didn't have that perspective until we came here to the Carolinas. At least I didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, my perspective of a relationship was getting home to a cooked meal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so you got to the Carolinas, um, and you mentioned a little bit about your faith. How did you come about to believe um, what you believe now? It's a good question because you, you would imagine that a kid growing up and going to Catholic school, right, in Jersey, you, well, this guy is, you know. But I hated, I hated Catholicism. I hated religion. I thought it was phony. I, I, it, to me, the rituals and everything about it was just disingenuous and, and I don't know, just— I came to the realization on a—and and I'm going to be honest about it—on a drunken bender— mm -hmm. Um, the, the spouse and I, we had made the transition, but it was a difficult transition and our relationship was rocky and we were going through some struggles. Um, you know, I, I wasn't completely convinced about this transition that I later now looking back, I'm like, yeah, that was the best thing that ever happened to us. Um, we had this neighbor, Joey Velez. 
Joey Vela is a really cool, cool guy. Um, he was a chaplain in the army mm-hmm. once upon a time, retired. And he tells me um, one day he meets me at the pool and he's like, hey, how you doing? The first thing that comes out of his mouth is, um, uh, have you found the church yet? And I said, yes, I'm in the South now for sure, right? Because that's the last thing anybody's going to say of where I came from. So I'm saying, man, all right, how do I get rid of this guy in a nice way? You know, I don't want to be that guy. You know, I'm just meeting him at the pool. I think it was the pool. And, um, but he wouldn't let up. He continued the conversation, which I'm grateful for now. And um, next thing you know, I'm, I'm visiting his apartment meeting his wife, his dog, and then there then then it came the question. Can you watch my dog when I go away? I said, I knew there was something behind <laughs> this. So I said yes, like an idiot. <laughs> and we developed the friendship after that. Um, I think it was genuine. and um, But one day I came home uh, rather sideways. And, um, you know, unsure of what the next steps were. And he was like, man, you're going to church with me, brother. And, he, you know, I go to church with him, tell the, tell the wife. My wife's like, I don't care. You know, go do what you want to do. You know, she's been there, done that. She came from a very um, legalistic family. So um, she's like, I know church. I'm not ready for church, nor, you know, that type of church that you're going to. Uh, you know, as you can tell by the way I'm speaking, she didn't like Joey either. <laughs> um, so I go to church, and it's Elevation Church mm-hmm. in Ballantyne at the time. And um, I'm hungover, <laughs> so my head's pounding. I'm wearing a suit jacket. I'm trying to look, like, proper, you know, like they do at church, right? You see mm-hmm. it in the movies. <laughs> And uh, so I go to the church and he's like, we have great seats. I'm like, does it matter? You know, like I'm thinking, you know, like when you go to a Catholic church, you know, you have all these pews and um, it's an auditorium, as you know. And, uh, and I'm saying, are we here for a play <laughs> or a concert or what's going on here? Am I going to be asked for money at the end of this? Sure enough, all these things started running through my head. I said, what did I get myself into? I said, all right, this is the latest cult trend. Ah, Dang it, I let myself into it, right? All right. And so music starts playing, and it's really nice. I'm like, this ain't church music. (laughs) At least not the one that I do. Um man, it's rock band. It's great. Everybody's praising. And I'm like, wow, this is good. Got my hands down to my side. I'm just kind of swaying like, all right, it's kind of good, but my head hurts. Okay. And, um, (laughs) so pastor comes out and everybody's just screaming like he's a rock star. And I'm like, who the heck is this guy? So what? How many guys I sat next to on an airplane that, you know, yeah, uh, he caught three, four touchdowns in one game. Who are you? You know, you ain't never, t- you know, you slam dunk a ball. You know, what are you, a power builder? And um, I was just immediately on judgment mode. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whatever. And I wasn't really listening to Pastor throughout the first part of the message. But then something triggered me, what he was talking about. And um, it really resonated with the person that I was before and the person that I was trying to be now. Mm-hmm. It was a identity crisis. And it's, it's interesting because I just did a podcast with um, Robert Moore III, and we talked about this as well. And then I had just gone this past year to the Indiana Outpost that originated for Carolina Outpost for Mission Uprising. And um, that was the topic, identity. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know that I was still struggling with the identity of who I was. Um, I was masquerading it with uh, this character called the one and only, and um, which I've dissolved. I, I said, no longer will this name 
um, embody me. But at the time, I was dealing with a different type of identity struggle, and um, it was during that message um, in April, early April, that uh, transcended to me in 2015 um, with that invitation that I was just like shocked beyond um, comprehension. Actually, it was earlier that year. I apologize. April was a race to life, but it was um, earlier that year. Uh, eventually, two weeks later, I would give myself to Christ. And it was um, an emotional battle, um, but it was genuine. Mm -hmm. And then I started asking my wife if I could bring my son to church, and she allowed it. And she realized, wow, they're having a great time. I want to check this out. So... The weeks went by, and Race to Life happened in April, and um, the message pushed me to baptism. Mm -hmm. And my wife still hadn't subscribed, I guess the best word, to the situation. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember just being in panic and not wanting and wanting to do it, and I actually went through the entire process and let everyone else that was being baptized be baptized. And I just was like, all right, I kept on taking off the shirt they gave me. I was like, oh, I'm not going to do it. I had people pray over me. And then I put on my shirt and, and then someone said, Hey, what's your wife's phone number? Let's get her over here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you can try, but she's not going to come. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. And she did, mm -hmm. and she witnessed um, what I did at the last moment. And as I'm coming out of the baptismal tank, you know, my son hadn't been there with me that day, and you know, we were just going through some struggles, and and my son was there at the end of the pool. That was when I knew um, my entire life God was with me. Um, and God doesn't intend for us to be hurt, but man, he really, he really pushed me in certain years. <laughs> but, um, I'll tell you what, it, it was, it was that moment that really changed my heart completely, completely. So many things happened after that, the Carolina outpost, I started a nonprofit called Feet Charlotte. Um, so many things manifested from that mm -hmm. moment, um, because I was inspired to move, um, and the best words, Pastor Furtick said, you know, if, if you can, uh, words can move a mountain, I guess. And, 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 and that still resonates with me. Words can move a mountain, not physically, but literally, if you ever echo down a canyon, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, it just continues until the canyon ends. Yeah. And it's almost like infinity. So that's how I felt. I felt like I had an infinite opportunity to give back now. Mm -hmm. So throughout your life, you went through ups and downs. Um, and you were going um, earlier on, you, you mentioned your motivation was more to basically not be poor but to to um, earn so that you can provide for yourself for your family and so on what have you learned about managing finances throughout your life that's good that's good I you know a lot of it came self-taught but again uh, a lot of it also attributes to how um, I saw different individuals in my life handle their household finances so it starts again with my brother-in-law you know, aka the stepdad in in California, and he he made um, such a drastic uh, approach to um, embodying the sense of financial wellness being the most important thing to um, my livelihood. And this individual um, surely is 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 not on the same faith based um, process as as me then or now, but. 
I think that he was being genuine about um, the realities of the world, Mm -hmm. you know, how um, struggles can often be um, um, perceived through the fact that we're financially incapable of sustaining ourselves. And he wanted to make sure that I understood the value in financial stability and building good credit and building a good foundation um, to monopolize all of my skills um, to move forward in life. My dad was good, too. My, my dad, at one point, had 11 kids in the same household that mostly were not his, <laughs> but he had to take care of. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, on top of that, he took care of his, his sister's family in, in another neighboring town and, and so forth. So I learned through what they managed, how to manage my own financial worth. And through those examples, I was able to uh, kind of um, curate my own path of um, financial wellness. And, and uh, it didn't work as well. I mean, there was a bankruptcy there for for some time in my previous relationship. And um, it really made me come to terms with um, the fact that I was an ill spender and a bad risk taker. Um, and then, you know, that all of that promise and, and, and opportunity was flushed away by me uh, seeking to use my leverage and finance um, as a tool for my pleasure right? Rather than using it as a tool for investment for the future. And that's where I started learning um, about investment. Mm -hmm. So more like um, investing in assets rather than investing in liabilities. Yeah. Or, you know, so-called investing. Yeah. I mean, I wish I had someone who would have said, hey, Juan, um, the first thing you want to do is um, buy yourself a house, but don't live in it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. You want to buy that house, don't live in it and then rent it, rent it for twice as much as your mortgage. That way you can pay all the utilities and all the taxes. And you tell that to the individual. You say, hey, we're, we're going to be paying everything. All right. To a certain cap. Mm-hmm. And this is yours for this term lease. Right. And do it and then increase gradually, gradually as you see the need for whether it's maintenance or whatever. And then once you meet the mortgage um, that it's paid in full, then you move on to the next project, you know. Um, And and, and there was other things um, that my brother-in-law taught me. He said, you know, when you take your first credit card out, make sure you have a bank account. He goes, but don't use bank account to make purchases at the store or here or there. He goes, use your credit card, but only use as much as you're earning. For that month. And then once you meet that cap, then bam, you pay your credit card. He says, the bank will see that as stability. Mm -hmm. And most people will see that as, well, wait a minute, you're using, but you're only using 10% of your worth on your credit card. So therefore, they're going to continue increasing the amount of money that they want you to spend. And the bank's going to allow you to build credit so that when you do decide to buy that second house, guess what? The bank is going to say, no, Juan's a smart investor. Look at his bank account. It's always one nodge here, one nodge there, up and down, always on a steady flow. Consistency is what he really banked on. Mm-hmm. So being consistent is um, beneficial in finances as well. What about um, as far as your personal health, uh, like exercise, eating right, what 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 are some routines that you have? What do you do about that? Lasagna. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Actually, that was the joke of the holiday season. We started out with a platter of lasagna. But, um, but all kidding aside, I was once upon a time an individual that was extremely unhealthy in terms of um, health, mind. You know, your mind is comes with all of that. Uh, the things you eat change your mindset um junk food Mm -hmm. changes your mindset Uh, if you eat mcdonald's all day guess what you may start reacting like the mcdonald's your body will start smelling like the product you eat 
And a lot of people don't agree with that. But I said, you know what? Go to uh, native cultures, all right? And uh, go to uh, different nations, whether it's in South America or in Africa or in Australia and indigenous tribes and see what they eat. And um, their, their bodies emanate what they eat, right? So the th same thing happens to us. If we just put in process garbage in our bodies, then that's how our bodies are going to react to it. I learned a hard way um, in 07 when I flatlined in Osceola Heritage Hospital in Kissimmee, Florida, um, while my wife and sister watched that I needed to make a change in my life. And, um, you know, everything stopped in my body. I was gone. What was the reason? Uh, my, my heart. That was it. Ticker's gone. That's it. Knock, knock. Who's there? Nobody. But what was the cause? Well, the cause was the fact that I was overweight. Mm -hmm. I mis um, use uh, drugs. I did um, uh, not exercise. So I was a highly, highly um, unhealthy individual. Uh, I went ahead and I met a doctor who said, you have several options. You can uh, lose weight traditionally. Um, we can help you that way. Um, you can do this new thing called gastric bypass. Or you can uh, die. <laughs> that was it. And I said, I don't like the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for that one. So um, I opted for gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. But he says, well... You know, that's the hardest option, right? And I said, how so? He goes, you're going to be working harder because you're going to need to relearn how to do certain things for your body. You have to no longer smoke. You have to give up carbonated drinks. You have to give up vices like beers and anything like that, alcohol. So it was, it was a shell shock. It was like, all right, do I want to give all that up? Do I want to give up pizza and lasagna? <laughs> and then he, you know, he says, you know, you, you, you eventually follow this program with a healthy exercise routine and you'll be great. And in a matter of three years, um, I went from 350 pounds to 120 pounds. Wow. I was too skinny though. I looked like, um, and I, I use this. Um, example, but I apologize in advance. Al Roker, who's a great person. I look like Al Roker, this big bobblehead, you know, guy. Al Roker had gastric bypass as well. And, um, and it was something that helped him in his life. But I looked too skinny. People started questioning whether or not I was sick. So you had the, the bypass or did you did it naturally? No, I had the bypass. Okay. But with the bypass, there's a process. There's a psychological process. You have to continue going to meetings and meeting with individuals. You have to continuously see your doctor for two and a half years. Um, you have to um, understand that your body is going to be eating smaller portions, extremely smaller portions the first um, two years for sure. Mm -hmm. And you're retraining your body to eat the foods that you once already knew how to eat, like uh, foods filled with carbs um, that can expand the wheat in your stomach. And gradually, your stomach is smaller, right? You go from, uh, most of us have a stomach as big as a basketball, right? And um, for the average individual, the softball effect is what we do. But we can stretch it as big as a basketball. I was stretching mine beyond the basketball. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just like, uh, eating machine they went ahead and mine was just like everyone else that has the surgery the size of an egg so you're putting two ounces of food at a time into your body and it was so difficult the first few weeks but eventually with um you know the help of my family my wife specifically and um I was able to get through that whole process. Mm -hmm. um, later on in life, you know, I was able to start 
um, eating the foods that I generally used to eat, but in smaller portions. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the most difficult things I do now is going to restaurants with individuals and saying, yeah, I'm going to skip the appetizer, and they don't understand why. Mm -hmm. Because if I eat the appetizer, then that's my meal. (laughs) (laughs) But um, uh, I had to change also. I was just way too um, small. So that scared the doctor. He was like, well, you need to put on some weight. Um, And I've been battling with my health um, in terms of either keeping a good muscle mass or just becoming very loose for the holidays, I guess, you know, very, very chunky and loose, Mm -hmm. you know, which most of us deserve, I guess, for the holidays. But I kind (laughs) of overindulge in the holidays. Yeah, we give ourselves excuses. (laughs) <laughs> that that we deserve it even though long term we may not want the results of it right? absolutely <laughs> uh, it's the whole short term over long term uh, thing uh what about um when it comes to continuous improvement like continuously learning things and improving yourself yeah. like what do you do to improve yourself and learn new things that's great so i never got to finish college mm-hmm so one of the things that I did later on in life after um, leaving sports and entertainment was I said, I'm going to go to school. Then I realized it was expensive. I needed to go part time. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, some some semesters I'll take one course, some I'll take two, depending on what's in the budget. But um, I went back to school and it's it's it feels great. Mm hmm. Um, I think learning should be a process that is natural for all of us. I think in our side of the world, we look at learning as a detriment, as a chore, as something that is taking away from our um, happiness and our joy. But in fact, the more you learn, the more you feel joyful because the more you feel confident about the things around you, the more you know about the things around you. So I've been on a journey to learn um, everything that I can about the business world, especially human resources, Mm -hmm. so that I can garner um, a reputation of being not just a powerhouse in marketing and and, and travel and and, um, uh, but just a powerhouse and and having a staff that's um, capable and knowledgeable because I just don't want to hire anybody. Uh, and I want to be knowledgeable about what I'm doing too in the process. Yeah. So, um, going back to school and, and, and I guess in earlier, like when we're young, uh, classroom setting is not for everybody, right? Right. <laughs> right. So like, but as you get older, you get a little bit more patience, a little bit more kind of delayed gratification. So you can listen a little longer. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I feel like it, it's, it's a lot more fun. The peers that I have at school online uh, truly enjoy having me there. Um, when we have discussion sessions, whether it's in the writing format or uh, video chat format, um, I tend to be the one that's louder, more vocal, and has uh, more to say, um, especially in our written discussions. Mm-hmm. Um, some people will look at it as, wow, you wrote a whole term paper there. Well, you know, I had a lot to regurgitate out on this, to this screen. So, um, But, you know, I bring out that old um, sense of um, that sponge-like want and need like a kid that naturally absorbs everything and i feel like if we all could envelop that as adults we'd be more happy you know we the more we learn that's why i engross myself in the bible learning the bible i always want to learn more even if i read the chapter over and over again or or the verse or or the book i want to reread it because there's always going to be a new message hidden there that i missed out the first time it's like um, um, recently I, uh, I took a course for Princess Cruise Lines. So Princess Cruise Line was one of those products that I was not a connoisseur of. <laughs> I'm not afraid to say that mm-hmm. because it's important for my clients to say, you know what, Juan's, you know, Juan's a real cool cat. He is genuine. He is telling us exactly what he knows. Um, I'm going to do business with him. 
I didn't know anything about Princess. I had a client come to me and say, hey, you know, I want to do Princess. I, I love the product. And I'm, and I'm thinking, well, the only thing I know is that next year's convention for uh, all the franchise owners will be on one of Princess's products. So I said, but that's not fair. I'm going to be taking this young lady's business and not knowing. So I was very transparent. I said, well, you and I are on the same learning path. We're going to learn this together if you allow this. And she she did. It was fantastic. I earned a client for life, I hope. And, um, and I learned the product and became certified in the product and the process. And, um, and, and, and surely some of the accolades from that is you earn um, perks like free cruises and, or if you do a resort, et cetera, you earn a free stay at a resort. But to me, it was beyond just getting that free certification to get a free cruise. It was now, hey, someone else calls me about a cruise. I can introduce to them to Princess and say, hey, Princess is a product that I just learned, and I think you should explore as your next family vacation. So I think it's great. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, cruises and so on. But before that, uh, as far as your like social circle, what what do you do? You engage in a lot of social activities. Do you stay back because you're doing so many things elsewhere? What's your social circle and social life like? Yeah, so socially, I think um, it, it's it's all about being strategic. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I use Carolina Outpost as a strategy. The men that I, you know, meet there kind of become part of my social circle structure. Um, some of them I meet in private settings. We have a really cool thing going on at the breweries right now at the print shop by Armor Artists, for instance. Um, uh, Travis Tolson, who's one of the owners there, he does this uh, pints and padres once a month and... Um, So I've met a lot of guys there and a lot of guys that are already in Mission Uprising on our programs for the Carolina Alpos go there. So that's part of my social structure there and social circle. Mm -hmm. And then other times I try to take my work mobile and be part of a group that's working mobile um, regardless of what industry they're in Mm -hmm. so that at least they don't feel confined to their... Um, homes and subjected to the loneliness that comes with uh, sometimes working by yourself. And um, so it, it, it's a lot of fun. Sometimes we'll do it at a coffee house. Sometimes we'll do it at the brewery. Sometimes, you know, wh- whatever the situation is. Mm-hmm. And that's another example of my social circle. And then I have friends outside of the realm that um, I meet continuously. You know, friends that I have that are um, uh, have been on this journey with me since I came to the Carolinas, um, who I've met through various ventures um, and will meet socially. Um, but for the most part, the main person in my social structure is my wife mm-hmm. and then my son. My son and I have a routine to go axe throwing or whatever his uh, latest um, fascination is like his photography but that's my main social structure and a lot of people might say well Juan you need friends yeah we I have friends but it starts with my wife who is not just my wife she's my best friend she knows more about me than anyone else will ever know trust me on that I'm sure you can relate yeah, yeah. Um, how old is your son my son will be 17 in February. So I have two sons. One of them is 15. He's going to be 16 in May. Okay. And he's he's on this dating uh, phase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He wants to date and so on. I was just curious, like, what are your thoughts on dating for teenagers? Um you know, it, it as a teenager who always had um, girls around him, right? And um, you know, I was I, I was uh, someone who, um, I guess the, the the right word that comes to mind is 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 uh, this song they used to call me, Mister Lover Lover. 
<laughs> but I was this big chunky kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and at school, especially high school in California, it was just like kind of my thing. And I had a really good um, girlfriend at the time. I won't mention her name. Uh, she actually works for Disney now uh, as an animator. And um, it was a great relationship, but I kind of always had a different relationship while I was with her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think dating for teenagers has to be exactly that. It can't be serious. It has to be more of an exploratory um, situation where, you know, our, our children are going to learn about their sexualities, um, um, whether we want it or not. And it's important for us to allow them to explore that in a safe way. And I'm not saying that we're going to allow them to pursue um, activities that are way too complicated and young for them to understand, but it's important to, for them to learn about the consequences behind certain things and um, relationships at that age allow them to, uh, especially men, become greater husbands later on in life so that they can earn examples of what they might have done wrong with a relationship as a young man or maybe mirror a relationship that they had great with a young lady um, and then maybe later on in life um, use that as a platform for their relationship in a marriage. So I, I think it's important for young men uh, to date, but responsibly, not just like I did, where I had one wrapped on each arm <laughs> <laughs> while I had one waiting for for me. And um, I think that's irresponsible. And that comes from society plaguing us with what's right and what's wrong, you know, especially for women. Women are plagued by billboards and and advertisements of how they should look. And, well, we are too, you know. We, we want to be that um, fly-by-night, you know, um, slick hair, oh, well, with the exception of me. <laughs> and, you know, that bravado and that machismo and, you know, what's up, you know, that attitude. But um, that's the wrong attitude. You know, that, that may be playful and all, but that's just an ignorant um, perspective. Yeah. Do you think uh, <clears throat> a certain age is too young? What's what's kind of like the, the earliest age you think would be okay? That's a good... Um, so I think, I think relationships between boys and girls um, that are um, sensual, that are, sen- that are innocent should be no more than um, when they're teenagers. I think before that age, I don't think they're mature enough to understand the complexities that come with the heartbreaks of a relationship. Like teena- teenagers, are the, the range is so great, right? 13, 19. I think a serious relationship for a teenager should never be a question. Mm-hmm. I don't think any teenager should be in a serious relationship. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think... Um, I think teenagers should avoid being in a serious relationship for many psychological purposes. I think teenagers should be having fun and exploring their friendships. And uh, if some friendships manifest to a greater relationship than others, those are the relationships they should be exploring. But a serious relationship, um, especially at a young adolescent age, should never be something that we qualify as or endorse. Um, I think uh, children should be continuing to be children and um, until they realize that they're an adult. And that takes experience and time. For some of us, we're still learning to be an adult. <laughs> right. Life is, uh, is challenging enough. <laughs> There's so much to learn as it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's an understatement, right? Um, you know, we, we wake up every morning with the challenge of knowing that we woke up. And will we have a next step after that? So that's that's the biggest burden that we should be worrying about. Uh, and especially for teenagers. Teenagers should be worrying about um, things like, um, you know, wh- wh- what am I going to do next semester in order to finish school quickly? Or, you know, those things. That's yeah. it. You know, and having fun about, oh, where are we going this summer? Where are we going to go hang out? 
that's that's what I would, you know, if I had to redo some things, that's what I would do. I wouldn't take any of the relationships that I had um, serious. Um, I would just use them as fun platform to learn from. That's it. Yeah. Um, so going back to um, going back to uh, travel, travel industry and so on, it, it seems like maybe just kind of my view but it seems with with the internet out there mm -hmm. all the information out there what is the real purpose of like travel agencies and travel yeah. planners and 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 so on with that like what what would you say to that well that's a great question and that that's a compounded question right yeah. and you can see that in the world we live in the ai generated world that we live in now it's easy to say hey juan your job's obsolete. I'll tell you what, I put anyone to the challenge, and I did this recently with a client. I said, go ahead and enter the AI and ask it to get you the best itinerary for where you're going nonstop, and then also tell you um, what the best authentic foods are in that local region and what the best itinerary is for a kid that only likes chicken nuggets um, a husband that doesn't like anything green in his food, um, and a wife that prefers to travel in the evenings only because she wants her kids to sleep on the plane. You can't. You need. You need. You still need that personal touch. Mm -hmm. We pride ourselves, and I keep on saying this, and people can um, check my sources, but we've outsold our competitors by forty-two percent. That includes online sources, et cetera. The reason being is because we become the products we sell. If you're going to Italy, we're going to make sure that we've either been there or know and have partnerships that are going to make your experience beyond your expectations. Plus, we're free. Mm -hmm. We're free. You have nothing to lose because the products we're selling are direct from the product component providers. The trick here is, is that you're going to say, well, Juan, well, how you make your money, right? Well, they pay us a lot of commission because they understand that the client that travels Delta Airlines, for instance, and has a joyous experience, they're going to remember they booked that travel with Juan Velasquez. And then they're going to go back and say, hey, Juan, you know what? I really enjoyed that flight on Delta. So Delta knows that they're going to become permanent customers or at least choose them first for their next trip so that's the reasoning behind that that they're going to use a travel source a travel provider or travel agency that's going to promote their product as being the best or the most reliable or the best source for their vacation needs you know everything needs to be chiseled out appropriately um i look at what the individual is like when i have an interview with a client i say well I'll say something like this. I'll say, hey, Jerry, why do you want to go to Hawaii? And you'll say, well, Juan, you know, because my wife said, no, no, I'll say, wait, wait a minute. Why do you want to go to Hawaii? And you'll say, well, you know, it's beautiful, uh, the beaches. And I said, no, no, Jerry, I, I know that. We, everybody knows that. But why do you want to go there? See, I want to find the feeling that that is in your heart that says, I want to go there because dot, dot, dot. I'll give you, for instance, my son wanted to go to Japan. And I said, John, that's fantastic. But why do you want to go? He says, well, Dad, I love anime culture. And, um, you know, I've been learning the language. And eventually that's where I want to live in life. And uh, it's on my bucket list. And I said, well, you know, it's a great bucket list. You are young. I said, but why do you want to go there, son? He goes, because I love it. It makes me feel good. Every time I see something from Japan, it excites me. And I said, all right, here we go. We're booking a trip to Japan. So we did. And I saw that excitement light up in his world as we explored all of Japan. So that's what I look for clients. Client can easily go shop at Costco for a trip. But they're going to get two things at Costco, which is great. Costco is a fantastic company. I shop at Costco. So if Costco is listening, trust me, I love Costco. But Costco sells toilet paper first. 
and then they sell vacations. Costco has incredible employees, but those employees clock out. I don't. When you're on vacation, I'm on vacation with you throughout that process. You have an issue, I'm there with you resolving that issue. Mm -hmm. You're having a great time, I'm there, you know, emphasizing, fantastic, let's move on. You know, one of the things that I pride myself is authenticity. If you're not authentic, don't do what you do. And then more importantly, you should be doing what you love, which is the key to any successful business. Right. And do you <clears throat> do you offer uh, so your services not just to individuals but to companies where if there's like a corporate trip or something like that, how does that part work? Is it pretty much the same? You're just dealing with with a company in that case? Yes and no. So yeah, we definitely love offering um, corporate outings and trips of that nature. Um, and sometimes it might be that they are putting on a performance challenge where maybe they have a sales team who's trying to meet a goal or criteria and the winner gets a free cruise, right? Um, so yeah, we work with different um, companies to um, curate an option that best meets their needs and corporations are looking to outsource that more and more especially to travel advisors. They do great with their in-house sourcing, but smaller corporations um, really seek out and franchisers. You know, you'll have like a, like a local Chick-fil-A, for instance. They'll look you up and they'll say, hey, we're looking to do an employee um, referral program or maybe an employee retention program or an incentive program, whatever it may be. And we put it together for them and propose it and say, this is how it would work. And this is how you would um, move forward with something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, you, you mentioned cruises. Is, is it just cruises that you offer or do you offer any kind of travel? I wish it was just cruises. <laughs> I have not <laughs> lied to you. <laughs> cruises is our bread and butter, hence the name of our company, Cruise Planners. Uh, but we are land and vacation experts, right? We actually sell more land packages through my franchise than we do cruises. Mm -hmm. um, and land packages have been boosting up um, since last year. More more demand. You know, the um, outbreak of this pandemic really put a halter on people's perspective. And then it's also jaded their perspective about cruising. You know, they have a lot of misinformation about whether or not they're going to get sick on a cruise. Um, but unbeknownst to them, I'll go back to my beloved Delta Airlines. You're more likely to get sick on close quarters like a Delta Airlines than you would on a cruise. Mm -hmm. You're in the tube of a plane for maybe three and a half hours on average, right? Most flights sharing the same bathroom with 150 other passengers and sitting on a seat that 150 other passengers sat on prior to you that has not been cleaned for days. Think about that. Yeah. So um, we try to emphasize um, that we understand the complexities of how people are shopping right now in terms of pushing towards more land. So we've been... Um, learning more about our partnerships with the resorts, um, doing more familiarization trips at the resorts, um, and garnering more relationships with local tour providers so that we can enhance these trips for individuals um, who want to prefer a land package versus a cruise. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so I, I found it that uh, whenever I go on vacation and I find... Either I find like little food places or places of interest or to do things that are local or like local people know it about uh, about them, but travelers don't. Those usually are the best experiences. How do you guys like help with that? Um, do you ever like get anybody local, like a local guide or or not even that? Not, not that they're because 
guides will kind of guide to the same path, mm-hmm. you know, everybody. Right. But more like have a more local, more one-off experience that would be positive. How do, how do you help with that? Yeah, no, and that's great because we try to make sure that we have organic experiences. And I think that's what we're getting at here is having that organic experience. Um, you don't just want to have um, – uh, a, a client say, well, we're going to go ahead and do, if they're on a cruise, for instance, and they want to do a shore excursion. And they'll say, well, you know, this one's listed on the ship as uh, a shore excursion. And it's probably generally the same shore excursion and the same person. And like you said, they're taking them to the same place. And it's kind of not an authentic experience. So what I do personally is I travel to different regions and I garner those relationships. I personally go there. That's something that the travel industry is struggling with. A lot of my um, associate partners, they struggle with that fact because they don't have um, the capability or the um, or they just don't have the willpower to go ahead or, you know, maybe they're an introvert and maybe they don't um, socialize with everyone. I, I talk to everyone. I try to find the most authentic individuals that are original to the area and meet with those and talk about what they can do for my client base. That way, when those clients get there, they say, oh, yeah, you're one of Juan's um, um, uh, clients for the travel agency. We're going to take care of you. We're going to show you the real side of whether it's Dominican Republic or um, maybe you're going to the Yucatan and they'll say, well, we're going to show you where the tourists don't go. We're going to give you some real food, authenticity. Right. Yeah. And then uh, as far as the different types of uh, vacations and traveling activities, what, how, how can you categorize them? And it's like, well, th- there's these type of vacations and these types and you can go to this area or this part of the world for this kind of experience. Yeah. Can you give a, a little bit of a range of types of activities, vacations, resorts, cruises that are out there? Yeah, definitely. I love that. Um, So let's start with the cruises, right? When it comes to cruising, you have um, everything from North America on up, which includes the Caribbean. And you have the Eastern and um, Western Antilles um, options. And some cruise ships that go into the Western Antilles do seven to ten options. Eastern Antilles try to do three to four day options. Um, And a lot of those places will include St. Thomas, uh, Antigua, um, uh, Trinidad, um, it'll, uh, Georgetown, it'll include, um, uh, Punta Cana, it'll include, um, Montego Bay, um, or, or uh, somewhere in Mexico like, um, Costa Maya or Cozumel. Those itineraries are typical for a North American trip. And what you get more out of those is you get more of a, 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 a mixed understanding to um, what the Caribbean is. A lot of misconception about the, mis- the Caribbean is it's all um, Latinx or Hispanic based. But in fact, there's Dutch, there's French, there's um, plenty of Irish that I know of. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it, it makes it really wonderful. You're, you're going to this melting pot unbeknownst to you that existed all along. And um, my clients love that. So I try to get them on itineraries in those parts of the world that are going to immerse them culturally into those um, um, places. Now, then you have Europe. Europe. You can do Europe is my favorite place to send people on long train excursions, Mm -hmm. right? Outside of the the cruising world, you want to do train rides that maybe you can do a world war ii uh, all all across germany um historical trip or maybe just do something that starts in um madrid and 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 heads down to portugal comes up around the coast into barcelona back north um italy italy by ferry right forget the cruise Mm -hmm. you know explore wine country to the roman coliseums you know, all the way out to Triste, you know, you you have an opportunity to have different immersive experiences through um, um, different local um, um, logistics. It's all about how you get around that you create the experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that certain regions require a certain logistics um, um, 
Europe, for instance, is full of railways. Why not capitalize on that and not only make it affordable, but strategic? Because now every place that they stop at, they're going to be immersed with the food, the atmosphere, the culture, the events, the festivals, everything that comes with it. Mm -hmm. But then you have clients that say, um, Juan, I want to go on a once in a lifetime trip. Those are my luxury travelers. Those are the, the travelers that have met all of their items on their bucket list and they want to do a safari mm -hmm. or they want to go to the Galapagos. They want to see stuff like the Antarctic um, uh, Circle. They want to go to places beyond what most people can afford. And um, those are more luxurious packages because they're exploratory. Mm -hmm. um, then you have those clients that are luxurious and they'll say, hey, Juan, you know what? All I want to do is go to Prague. I want to go to Paris. You know, I want to I uh, uh, experience Milan. In the summer, um, I want to want to visit, um, you know, places that bring um, the light, like Monaco, or or uh, a sense of adventure in in, in style and class. So mm -hmm. I, I get those too. I get those a lot. A lot of those. You get um, people in uh, traveling to like Southeast Asia. Do you do? Uh any of those absolutely trips? seoul korea um all the way down to vietnam and laos and china mm -hmm. of course hong kong is a popular destination um uh, malaysia and the philippines has been uh, one of those places that really has been a springboard for asia right now uh, thailand has always been busy um, but uh, places like malaysia and and um, indonesia Philippines, those places are, are really up and coming. Mm -hmm. um, those trips, we um, kind of do multi-generational trips on those. Multi-generationals, multi-families. You know, you, maybe you'll have grandpa, grandma, or maybe one of them is gone, and then you'll have mom and dad, and then uh, a teenager that's already in college, and maybe a really young sibling. Those are fun. Those are fun. I, I, I try to cater those um, and match them through a company called Disney Adventures. A lot of people think Disney is just a park <laughs> or just a cruise line. Yeah. But I got a secret. They have a company called Disney Adventures. And they have people that work all around the world that we partner with to put you on those exciting trips for multi-generational families. I mean, you can do it as a couple but it really caters to multi-generational families. Yeah. Uh, what other things would you want to share about uh, your business, about your life? Yeah, well, you know what? I will share a couple things. <laughs> I will share that um, starting a business is one of the hardest things that I've ever done. Um, it has um, humbled me because once upon a time, I thought, well, being in business and being a business owner, I'll work less. I'll have people who work for me. I don't have to work this nine to five. I'll tell you what, and I'll go back to what I said before. You have to love what you do because I get up sometimes five, four in the morning and go to bed at three in the morning for my clients. And that's dedication. That's because I love what I do. But I don't think I would be loving what I do if I was maybe opening up a pizzeria, although I love eating pizza. <laughs> I don't think I would love working at a pizzeria as an owner. Right. So there's a huge difference in loving the product because you can love travel, but being a travel agent owner might be the worst thing for you. Yeah. And my life has been that of um, a series of challenges that I have sought myself to do more and further than most people thought I could. Mm -hmm. And if I had to tell anyone who was starting a business or making a risk or, you know, thinking about what challenge they can um, take on and overcome that adversity from, I would tell them, go for it. 
with the mindset that you've already succeeded. However, don't think that there's not going to be a moment that there's going to be an area where it's going to knock you down and bring you back 10 steps full, uh, ten steps backwards. It's how you move 20 steps forward after that. Yeah. So I would tell anyone that, and I would tell them wholeheartedly, go for it. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, one, um, it's definitely been great having you here. I appreciate it. And um, I'm looking forward to talking to you some more, maybe some more specific topics in the future, whatever will come up. Yeah, definitely. I love yeah. this. I absolutely love this. And I'm looking forward to uh, um, hearing some feedback from some of our viewers for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Well, thanks, everybody. And we'll see you in the next one.